Republican leadership fed up with being hammered by the liberal media and they're doing something about it. However, pause a moment. One GOP candidate thinks his party needs to stop whining about the media and start turning voters around with talk of issues. What a concept. The national debt has doubled under the leadership of Barack Obama. Pause a moment. How much of the blame should he take? And what about that dastardly do-nothing Congress of two parties who haven't been able to get along since the Nixon-Kennedy debates? When the issue becomes illegal immigration in America and illegal immigrants committing homicide, some people never want to hear from the families of those losing loved ones to the crime. We're going to fix that. And here's the biggest novelty of the weekend, a politician admitting an error and in the process admitting what voters should be doing with their presidential candidates. We're about to change your Monday for the better. I'm Ed Berliner. This is the Hardline for Monday, November 2nd, 2015. I will do everything in my power to win this race, but there's some things I'm not willing to do. I will not compromise on my principles. I will not trade in an optimistic outlook to put on the cloak of an angry agitator. And I will not make anyone feel small so I can feel big. He was once the heir apparent, the can't-miss son, and it would take a Herculean effort on the part of opponents to dislodge Jeb Bush from the favorite's role for Republican candidate in November 2016. But now here we are, months out of Iowa still, and the prodigal son has become the reboot wonder. All this as the Republican National Committee perhaps needs to start wailing away instead of whining. Sauce for the goose, let's get to work. He is the senior editor of the National Review Online and has thus survived many an interesting story inside the Beltway, Jay Nordlinger. Joined by the national political correspondent for the Washington Post, who, along with Robert Costa, broke an interesting story today about how Donald Trump did what he believes he does best, take control, David Weigel. Gentlemen, I want to thank you both for joining us. Jay, I'm going to begin with you. We're going to get to Trump in just a minute here, but let me get right on to Jeb Bush. He hopes an e-book can relaunch a struggling campaign. His hashtag is being hammered around social media tonight. I hate to say this out loud, some people may get on me for this, but is it just time to say that Jeb Bush is done? Well, uh, he's been campaigning for president for months now, maybe more, and it's probably too early to give up. I myself, if I were running, would want to give voters a chance to vote against me before dropping out. And these early dropouts, such as Tim Pawlenty four years ago, I think, and Scott Walker and Rick Perry this year, I don't fully understand. I myself would want to make Iowans and New Hampshireites and others vote against me if the money were there. And for Jeb, I assume it is. David, there's the next thing about the money, because it's interesting how over the weekend, Paul Singer, who's the billionaire New York investor, basically said that he was going to throw his money and his efforts behind Marco Rubio right now. So I think what Jay is saying is correct. You want to stick in there. You want to have the money. But has he already done too much damage in basically being the second reboot king? I don't know that he was in a good position to even damage in the first place. Uh, I've always been very bearish when Jeb Bush is a nominee. I just don't see the logic if you're a Republican voter who just watched your party win a landslide in 2014. I don't see the logic in settling for someone like Jeb Bush. So if you look at his approval numbers, he's always, I should say favorable because he's not in office, he's always been very low. He's, he's been be behind Donald Trump for most of the year. He's been in the 40s, kind of mired there. And this is after months of campaign advertising, about nine months of campaigning. Personally, there's just no evidence that voters really will even want to give the guy a chance, especially when they've got a, a field of really impressive candidates. Let's get to you, Jay, on a word that was just used here by David a moment ago, settling. And I think that's how a lot of people feel. They still think that Jeb Bush is the settling candidate right now. You agree with that? I'm not sure I do. Uh, the voters will have a broad choice. There are, what, 12, 15, 16 candidates in the race? Uh, that's a pretty diverse box of chocolates, so to speak. So if they don't like Jeb, they can vote for someone else. But Jeb Bush is a terrific guy, very capable. He's proven. And I think there's every reason for him to be in the race. But you never know what the voters' mood will be. And they don't seem to be in a pro-Jeb mood this year, at least so far. Let's talk about something else here, and I mentioned this at the top, Donald Trump. And David, you and Robert Costa broke this story today on the Washington Post. 
It's an interesting story because it seems to be just rife with all sorts of conflict issues here. It says Trump and his advisors, I quote now from the Post, have decided to work directly with TV executives, take the lead role in negotiating the format and content of primary debates. Robert, you now have a candidate whose own company is going to start deciding what's done in the debate. That's extraordinary. You do. It's somebody with a very long record of negotiating, as he will point out every time he's in front of a camera. Uh, I think from my reporting today, this does not really change the fact that most campaigns are trying to come up with a unified front with uh, with the TV networks. They want not really for the Fox debate, but for, for further, in, further debates, candidates to almost unionize in an ad hoc way and get commitments to certain rules. Uh, and the, the main ones being opening and closing statements, fairness in how many questions are asked, how long people get with questions. They just feel that CNBC was so out of control and the RNC was so bad at protecting them that they want to renegotiate. And that's the commonality between what Trump is doing and what everyone else is doing. The only wrinkle is whether those guys can do it if a couple people refuse to sign on. And if one guy who, frankly, is, I, I think, the reason for the debate's ratings being so high, if one of these guys doesn't want to participate. Jay, does that bother you to see that Trump's, basically Trump and Trump's people are going to try to take control here of the debates? Uh, well, a little bit. My feeling is that the candidates will out no matter what. Their personalities, their views, no matter what the debate, the format, the questioners, the candidates will out. I thought this most recent debate was very entertaining and fairly revealing about the candidates. I think the questioners did a, a poor job. I think the condemnation of them is right. And yet the candidates had a chance to strut their stuff and by the way, it can be quite advantageous to them in a Republican primary to bash the media. Uh, the candidates really welcome it, no matter what they may say after. Let me then talk about the debate here and turn to something else. On Morning Joe today, Governor Chris Christie actually made the rounds. But the first time I saw him this morning was in Morning Joe, where he said that the Republican candidates shouldn't expect unbiased questions from liberal moderators. I thought he put it best. Here's what he said. I'm not one of these complainers about this, yeah. okay? Listen, I said what I thought the morning after. Um, listen, are we shocked that, like, John Harwood is biased? Please. I mean, Harwood's been that way his entire career. So if you're standing up there and you're expecting to get a fair question from John Harwood and not have him debate you... David, does he have a point? Because the thing that struck me is just to this point. Don't worry about the questioners. You know they're liberal hacks. You know they're going to come after you. Answer the question. Basically, go at them. And I thought what he said, look, if I can't handle these guys, how am I going to handle Hillary Clinton? Well, as long as we're talking about Hillary Clinton, contrast this negotiation with Clinton sitting for 11 hours with, with breaks, but 11 hours in front of the Benghazi Commission. This is not a contrast that I think as well in the long run for every Republican versus the Democrat they're going to be running against, especially because they want to make the argument that she's uh, distrustworthy and old and out of touch. So this might be a little spasm in the campaign. I think the more interesting and more telling aspect of this is that just as he's done with the rest of the campaign this year, Trump has exposed the growing irrelevance of the party structure, the growing uh, sense that the media needs to be made irrelevant, and there's not really any force that can put him back into the barn because there are, he's, when it turns out when he speaks, there are lots and lots of conservatives, possibly a majority of the base, that agree with him and that want these institutions to be p taken down a couple of pegs. I've only got about a minute and a half left, so let me get to this, and here's what everybody is talking about right now. David, I'm going to throw this to you first. There is no doubt in the minds of many, even liberals, that there is a liberal media bias, and we are seeing it now greater than we have ever seen it before. Agree or disagree? I think there's a cultural bias, I think, on social issues, definitely uh, a bias but from who gets into the media. That, that's not worth disputing, in my view. Is it worth, though, making a big deal out of, David? I think, I think it's worth making a big deal of to the extent that somebody with those views, and I have some of them, uh, can at least be goaded into treating, you know, trying to cover the issue more fairly. Sometimes if you come in with... Uh, an ideological view or even blinders and you are we learn just how different the opinion of the people you're covering is that can be more that can be informative uh, but I think it's it's worth confronting the idea that the media is just an amorphous ideal ideology free you know, organism that has no idea has has no bias whatsoever that's not worth pretending about there are I think reporters who work to be that way but the the climate we come from 
uh, the education we have, et cetera, I think le leans people in a certain direction. All right, Jay, I got about 40 seconds left from your opinion point. What about that liberal media bias that now seems to be taking over the conversation? Well, I think it, it's a fact of life. I think Republicans are long used to it. I quote my colleague Cato Byrne, who said some years ago, it's like we, meaning Republicans, run every race with a weight tied to our ankle. We just have to be better. This bias needs to be assumed. And a deft candidate, such as Chris Christie, can turn media hostility to his advantage, certainly in a primary. The general election, that's a little dicier. There you go, guys. Basically tell the candidates, stop worrying about the bias, get to the issues, tell the voters what they want. Gee, I think we've uncovered a shocking way to do a debate from here on out. Jay Norlinger from the <laughs> National Review Online, David Weigel from the Washington Post. Make sure you read that article in the Washington Post today, late breaking, that talks about Donald Trump now getting involved in the debates. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. They are the survivors, the ones who have to stand by helpless as families are killed by people who have no right to be in America. That's next on The Hardline.